Good afternoon. The first item of business today is portfolio questions on economy, jobs and fair work. And we start with question number one from Richard Lyle. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is being taken to alleviate the noise levels impacting on residents since the completion of the M8, M73, M74 improvement programme. Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown. Uh, significant work has been undertaken to mitigate the effect of the M8, M73, M74 motorway improvements project. During the construction phase of the project, 24 acoustic barriers or noise buns have been created on the M8 and the A725. And this mitigation has been provided in each instance where the predicted noise increase as a result of the project is more than one decibel. Furthermore, low noise road surfacing, which produces less traffic noise than previous types of road surfacing, has been used on the new road construction, benefiting all neighbours to the project. Richard Lyle. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for the answer, but quite honestly, uh, what he says has been done has not been done for the residents that I'm speaking about. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware of the ongoing case of the noise and other impacts faced by my constituents at Burn. Acre Gardens in Uddingston. Can I therefore ask what assistance he, he can provide me with in facilitating a meeting with my constituents and the Chief Executive of Transport Scotland in order to work towards a positive outcome for all involved? Cabinet Secretary. Well, of course, I have had discussions with a member on this issue previously, and I can confirm to him that. Uh, he will have been sent a response uh, from the Chief Executive of Transport Scotland agreeing to his request to meet with him and once again I'm happy to discuss the member with the member further after that meeting. I could also say though both to Richard uh, Lyle and also to all other members involved in this that um, there's no question this has been a hugely beneficial project but it does necessitate some disruption uh, and some uh, inconvenience to uh, the local population. That is true of all major transport projects. But I'm very grateful to the member for the support that he's given for this project, even while raising the issues of concern to his constituents quite rightly. And as he knows and I know, this is a huge benefit to Central Scotland and to the transport network of Scotland. A half billion pounds of investment, including for the first time motorway being established between Glasgow and, uh, and Edinburgh. Question number two, George Adam. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action is, is taking to encourage economic growth. Cabinet Secretary. We're taking a number of actions to support long-term economic growth, including significant investments in transport, as I've just mentioned, uh, digital connectivity, and supporting investment in our cities and regions. Moreover, we're expanding funded early year, early learning and childcare uh, facilities to improve young children's outcomes and reduce barriers to parents participating in the economy. We've also invested over £5 billion in the higher education sector over the last five years, with a further £1 billion allocated in 2017-18. To boost Scotland's trade, exports and international connections, we've established a board of trade and are creating permanent trade representation in Berlin and Paris to add to our innovation and investment hubs in Dublin, London and Brussels. George Adam. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer. The Fraser of Allender Institute believes that up to 80,000 jobs could be lost to Scotland in the back of a hard Brexit. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that this is simply unacceptable and that it proves that the UK Government is playing fast and loose with the future of many Scots families as the Westminster Government continues to struggle to come to terms with the EU during Brexit negotiations? Cabinet Secretary. Both the member and the Fraser of Allander Institute really uh, underline the real risk that Brexit poses to the Scottish economy. Uh, the EU is the largest single market for Scotland's international exports, with exports worth £12.3 billion in 2015, an increase of £520 million on two, uh, 2014. And the research undertaken by the Fraser of Allander Institute estimates that after 10 years, GDP is expected to be over 5% lower than would otherwise be the case, and that's £8 billion in 2015. 16 terms. It also estimates that leaving the European Union single market and customs union threatens 80,000 Scottish jobs after a decade. In fact, the BBC reported only this week that the Bank of England believes up to 75,000 jobs could be lost in the UK financial sector alone in the event of a hard Brexit. So it's no wonder that the Fraser of Allender have said in their latest economic commentary 
that in looking forward, the greatest cloud on the immediate horizon remains the Brexit negotiation. That's why we're using all the powers at our disposal to grow the Scottish economy. It's also why the UK government should release, in relation to the request made by my colleague Mike Russell, all the analysis they've done on the different sectors and parts of the UK in order that we can take the best possible decisions to protect the Scottish economy from the Tories' obsession with Brexit. Dean Lockhart. Uh, thank you. Figures released last week show that the UK economy expanded by 1.5% compared to growth of only 0.5% for Scotland under the SNP. The SNP are clearly trying to blame Brexit for Scotland's economic underperformance, but the reality is that Scotland's economy under the SNP has been lagging behind for years, years before Brexit. And future growth under the SNP is forecast to remain low for years to come. So when will the Cabinet Secretary start taking responsibility for delivering economic growth that Scotland deserves and stop blaming Brexit and others for this government's economic incompetence? Cabinet Secretary. It's interesting that when the previous quarter's figures came out which showed Scottish growth at four times the rate of the UK, I wasn't asked to take responsibility for that uh, by the member. But the head in the sand attitude is just absolutely appalling. It's not just me saying, it's not the Fraser of Allender Institute who uh, many of the members on that side like to quote regularly. It's the Bank of England are saying the same. It's every economic commentator. Yeah. The UK having projected the lowest growth of all the EU countries. It is simply the case that Brexit is the major threat to this economy. Yeah. Now, perhaps he disagrees with that. Yes. That may be the case. He disagrees with every economic commentator. Perhaps, as he has said, or he has not said, there is no uh, threat at all from Brexit. He seems to be very sanguine about that. There's a huge threat from Brexit. But it would be interesting to know if he supports the call that Mike Russell has made so that we get the detailed analysis done by the UK government to better inform our decisions on the Scottish economy. Yeah. Does he support that or does he not, I wonder? Jackie Bailey. The one thing we can agree on, presiding officer, is that year-on-year -year comparison of GDP figures shows that the Scottish economy grew by 0.5% and the equivalent UK growth was 1.5%. So I'm interested to know what the Scottish Government is doing to close the gap, but specifically in the context of reducing capital infrastructure budgets, would the Cabinet Secretary consider a fiscal stimulus for the construction industry? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, we have done exactly that in the past, as a member knows, fiscal stimulus, not least after the decision on Brexit. Uh, decisions, though, on capital expenditure, as with those on revenue expenditure, will be for my colleague Derek Mackay to answer. And, of course, he and I, not as recently as yesterday afternoon, were discussing this very issue. And, of course, we want to maximise the capital investment there is in the economy. We've seen the benefits of that over many years, whether it's the Queen's Ferry Crossing, the M8 bundle, or all the other infrastructure works that really should have been done years ago by different parties in this chamber, and it's been down to the Scottish Government to bring forward. We will continue to do that to the maximum of our ability to do it, using not just the resources available to us, but any new means, such as the Scottish National Investment Bank, that might help us increase capital expenditure. On that, I think Jackie and Bailey and I share the same aim. Questions three and four were not lodged. Question number five, Linda Fabiani. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government how it promotes the carbon-free economy. Minister Paul Wheelhouse. The Scottish Government undertakes a range of activities, not only to promote, but to also accelerate Scotland's transition to a low-carbon economy. To name a few, we have committed uh, a further £60 million to support innovative low-carbon energy projects through the Low Carbon Infrastructure Transition Programme. We have committed to the Scottish Energy Efficiency Programme, making a, available a minimum of £500 million over an initial four-year period from 2017-18. And we have promoted low-carbon actions through Greener Scotland to encourage changes in consumer behaviour that households can take. Linda Fabiani. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I know that the Minister recognises the contribution that East Kilbride has made to the Scottish economy in the 70 years since it became Scotland's most successful new town. Does he recognise now, though, that in terms of... <laughs> Cumbernauld's rather good as well, I, I hasten to add for his fellow Minister. <laughs> does he now recognise... <laughs> and Glen Rothes. Does he now recognise that in terms of zero waste, in terms of recycling, green transport, and industrial innovation towards the circular economy, EK could easily become an exemplar of the carbon-free economy in Scotland. And will the Minister undertake to meet again with um, members of the East Cobride Task Force to discuss East Cobride's future in this way? Minister. 
Well, I think I'm glad that uh, Linda Fabiani managed to keep the peace in the chamber, presiding officer, um, sitting next to Jamie Hepburn. Uh, I, was, I was nervous there for a while, but I, I welcome, certainly welcome East Kilbride's uh, ambition to become a carbon-free uh, model location. And uh, Linda Fabiani is quite right. Fabiani is quite right. Uh, we met with the task force, and it was a very positive meeting. Um, and as, as I've just reinforced, the Scottish government offers a, a number of policy measures and funding opportunities aimed at accelerating uh, the transition to low-carbon uh, growth. And these go beyond the three examples I gave uh, with further support for business communities and individuals. Um, I, I think in, in thinking in response to the, the particular request, uh, in the first instance, if um, Linda Fabiani is agreeable to this, I'd be happy to ask my officials to offer a meeting with representatives of East Kilbride, whether that's the local authority or other uh, parties, to explore how sources of support from Scottish Government and our agencies might best be utilised to support uh, the very laudable aim uh, that East Kilbride has to be a low-carbon model. Uh, and there, of course, I would be happy to meet with the task force or others uh, following that once that discussion has taken place. Question number six, Jenny Gilruth. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to stimulate business growth in areas with high unemployment. Uh, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the Scottish Government uses all available levers to create the economic conditions to stimulate business growth in areas with high unemployment. Working closely with a wide range of partners, including the enterprise agencies, Skills Development Scotland and, of course, local authorities, we work to ensure that businesses of all sizes and sectors can access the support that they need to grow and create employment opportunities. Jenny Gilruth. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. In my constituency of Mid Fife and Glenrothes, we have the highest rate of unemployment in Fife at almost 11%. Can the Cabinet Secretary advise what the Scottish Government proposals are to create jobs and apprenticeships in areas of high unemployment to ensure more of our young men and women get into work and stay in work? Cabinet Secretary. Hey. First of all, I would uh, mention the fact that the unemployment figures, of course, it's true, as Jenny Gilruth says, are different in different parts of the country, but we do currently have the highest uh, employment figures on record, 2,655,000 people in work in Scotland. We have higher employment rates and lower unemployment rates than the UK. We never heard that mentioned by the Conservatives, of course, uh, with 91,000 more people in employment compared to the pre-recession peak. Uh, youth unemployment rates continue to outperform the UK, and that comes on top of us fulfilling our commitment to reduce youth unemployment by 40 per cent four years ahead of schedule. Notwithstanding all of that, uh, these are positive figures, but we recognise there are still many barriers to people getting into work, and we're continuing to work to improve labour market conditions, not least through expanding the range of opportunities available to young people through our apprenticeship programme, and our recently announced £96 million of investment to deliver fairer employment support services through the new Fair Start Scotland programme uh, in a statement announced to the Parliament by Jamie Hepburn. And the latest employment figures last week show the Scottish economy continues to perform well against a difficult backdrop with a lack of a clarity from the UK government on Brexit and proposals to leave the world's biggest single market, posing the single biggest threat. However, those good figures mean that we do have to redouble our efforts on areas where we still have issues. And Jenny Gilruth's uh, constituency is not far from mine. We do have some similar challenges. This is the opportunity we have to try and address that by some of the means which I've just outlined. Uh, question number seven, Gail Ross. Thank you, President Officer, to ask the Scottish Government how many Section 36 applications are in progress in the Caithness, Sutherland and Ross constituency. Minister Paul Wheelhouse. Uh, there are eight applications made under Section 36 of the Electricity Act in, in progress in the Caithness, Sutherland and Ross constituency. Of these, four cases are currently with the Planning and Development Appeals Division, or DPEA, uh, to administer the public local inquiry process. Gail Ross. I thank the Minister for that answer. Would he agree with me that the potential in Caithness, Sutherland and Ross for renewable energy, particularly from hydro and wave technologies, is incredible? And will the Scottish Government work to ensure that any new policies on wild land will factor in the need for renewable energies that are not necessarily wind generated? Minister. Uh, well, certainly the Scottish Government, I uh, want to put on record, is very strongly committed to supporting the continued growth of the renewable energy sector, not just in Caithness, Sutherland and Ross, but of course across Scotland as a key driver of economic growth. Nevertheless, uh, we do recognise that through the planning system, we, we need to ensure that each application is considered on its own merits and that uh, we take into account any potential detriment to our natural environment. Having said that, though, uh, Gil Ross um, make, makes mention of wild land, and wild land is, is not a formal designation as such, and it's important to recognise that it is certainly now taken into account in making uh, determinations on planning applications. But it's important to stress Scottish planning policy is clear that development may be appropriate in wild land areas where impacts can be substantially overcome by siting, design or other mitigation. And any future revisions to Scottish planning policy will be subject to consultation 
pollution. But as Gil Ross has also identified, there are a number of other technologies which have less impact on wild land, including we very strongly support investment in uh, hydropower, uh, as, as has been mentioned, also wave and tidal power, and indeed offshore floating and fixed installation wind, wind uh, farms uh, to enable uh, development of our uh, vast renewable resources, but with hopefully uh, minimal impact on, on issues like wild land. Edward Mountain. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Section 36 appeals, whilst free, incur considerable legal costs. The Highland Council, who represent local views, are finding appeals a real financial burden. Will the Scottish Government help them with the extra funds, given the number of wind farms in the Highlands that are being decided under Section 36 powers? Minister. Well, clearly, um, we, we do, uh, we believe, resource local government uh, you know, well to, to deliver the services of planning uh, functions that they deliver on our behalf and on behalf of the local communities. Uh, we'll obviously be prepared to listen to any particular concerns maybe about the volume activity, but we have been here before. Obviously, there have been areas of the country that have had waves of investment in uh, renewable energy uh, around the country and borders and south of Scotland uh, being one region that I'm very familiar with and uh, those issues have been managed well at a local level uh, but obviously if there are particular issues I would encourage Mr Mountain to make, th make them uh, uh, known to the planning minister um, Kevin Stewart who will be able to take forward any concerns he has. Question number eight, Kenny Gib Kenneth Gibson. <laughs> Thank you, presiding officer. To ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to grow the economy of North Ayrshire. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the government is committed to promoting economic growth across all the communi communities, uh, including those, of course, in North Ayrshire. Our substantial investment in infrastructure, regeneration and business support helps to deliver inclusive growth and economic resilience, creating and retaining jobs in communities across the area. Uh, for example, and it is just an example, the Scottish Government Modern Apprenticeship Programme has supported over 800 modern apprenticeships, new starts in North Ayrshire in each of the past four years. We recognise that apprenticeships, for one example, are an essential way for all employers, regardless of size and sector, to develop their workforce and to contribute to business and economic growth. Kenneth Gibson. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Does he share my concern that neither North Ayrshire nor Ayrshire as a whole are keeping up with economic or income growth in Scotland and the UK such that it is? What specific steps will the Scottish Government take to narrow that growing gap and tackle unemployment, particularly in the over 40 age group? Well, the member is entirely right to draw attention to that, and of course we are focused on areas where there may be a lag in terms of uh, other communities across Scotland. Uh, as I've stated already, the government is committed to promoting economic growth across all of our communities. I would want to, though, take cognizance of the proactive, positive steps already taken by North, South and East Ayrshire on their plans to create a new partnership to boost the economy of Ayrshire. I think this is a tremendous step and one which other local authorities will be looking to with interest. And that proposal to establish an interim Ayrshire Development Board and explore options to deliver a single Ayrshire economic vehicle aiming to drive change across the three areas in partnership is, is really an example of partnership working in action. So for our part, the Scottish Government will continue to support the Ayrshire Councils as they develop this approach to working with all partners. We will make sure that the agencies for which we have responsibility work with those partners. And of course, we have the ongoing commitment, as we stated many times, to explore uh, an Ayrshire growth deal. It would be far better if we were able to have the UK Government working with us in relation to that. But along with that, we will look at any other options we can to improve economic performance and income growth uh, in uh, North Ayrshire, as the member suggests. Jamie Green. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Does the Cabinet Secretary not share my concern that the number of people in work in North Ayrshire has plummeted by 10% since his government came to power a decade ago? And what words of comfort does he have for the people in North Ayrshire that this negative trend will reverse any time soon? Cabinet Secretary. I think much of the previous answers that I've given, I think success will undoubtedly look um, like something born of a partnership. And that partnership that we've seen already through the initiative taken by the three Ayrshire councils uh, is very promising, not least uh, the commitment I've just given that the government's agencies will work with that partnership. We've encouraged it to happen in the first place. Uh, we've also said that we will respond positively to the suggestions from those three local authorities for an Ayrshire growth deal. Uh, and again, once again, I would state that we would want to have the UK government, who have refused so far to do so, to be part of that growth deal in order that we can do exactly as the member suggests and uh, Kenneth Gibson, and that is to increase employment opportunities in that part of the country. Question number nine, Ash Denham. To ask the Scottish Government whether it has had sight of the economic analysis that has been carried out by the Department for Exiting the European Union. Cabinet Secretary. 
Uh, I'm sorry to say the Scottish Government has not had any access to any analysis carried out by the Department for exiting the European Union on the economic impact of leaving the EU for either the UK or the Scottish economies. Ashton. Figures from the London School of Economics show that every single part of Scotland and the UK as a whole will be adversely affected, even in the event of a soft Brexit, with single market membership maintained. Would the Cabinet Secretary agree that the UK Government cannot keep their assessment of the impact of Brexit from the Scottish public and from Scottish businesses? And would he reiterate calls for the paper to be published? Cabinet Secretary. I, I think the member is exactly right. And the question is, why do they want to not share this with the Scottish Government? We have a, a, a responsibility for the economy of Scotland. We're constantly reminded of that by the mm -hmm. Tory front bench. And yet they do not want to share the figures commissioned, paid for by taxpayers in Scotland and the rest of the UK to let us. And I wonder why it is they don't want us to see that analysis. Is it because the only part of the UK that thinks there's going to be no impact from Brexit is this part of the UK just over here? They are convinced there's no problem with Brexit. Well, if that is the case, they should release those figures. The member is exactly right. And the LSE research that she refers to highlighted, uh, as she says, uh, that no part of Scotland will be unaffected by a hard Brexit. The Scottish Government has repeatedly called on the UK Government to publish their assessment of the impact of Brexit. And the Scottish public has a right to know the effect of leaving the EU, the effect it will have on their communities, on their jobs and their livelihoods. So surely the members of the Conservative Party should back the call from Mike Russell to UK ministers to release this analysis right away for the benefit of people of Scotland. Thank you. That concludes questions on economy, jobs and fair work. We move to finance and the constitution. Question number one, Tom Arthur. When the finance secretary last met the UK government and what was discussed? Cabinet secretary, Derek Mackay. At the chief secretary to the treasury on Thursday, 26th of October, along with Mark Greatford, the cabinet secretary for finance and local government in the Welsh government, plus the permanent secretary of the Northern Ireland executive. As I advised the Finance and Constitution Committee, the agenda for the meeting included discussion on the prospects for the inaugural UK autumn budget, an update on Brexit, including any progress on EU programmes and guarantees, and also used the opportunity to once again call on the UK Government to reverse their planned cuts in expenditure, lift the 1% pay cap for all public service workers, and provide sufficient resources for pay rises across the UK, which at least match inflation. Tom Arthur. Cabinet Secretary for that answer. I wonder in the course of these meetings if the UK Government was able to explain why they are reducing the railway allocation budget to Scotland by £600 million. Cabinet Secretary. No, there certainly hasn't been a satisfactory explanation to that. Uh, members in the Chamber might be aware, uh, certainly should be aware, that the UK Government want to change the formula that was uh, overseen by the regulator before, and that was essentially a share of investment in the railways uh, in terms of how much of the railways was in Scotland. The UK Government have uh, proposed to change that and thereby reduce the resources to Scotland and not give us the resources that we would require uh, to maintain it and develop it in the fashion that we would all wish to see. And I would encourage all political parties to engage in this very important issue to ensure that we get a fair deal for the railways in Scotland. Yeah. Murdo Fraser. Uh, thank you, President. Officer. I understand during his meeting uh, with the Treasury, the Finance Secretary pushed for more public spending. Can he tell us what additional level of borrowing he thinks the UK Treasury should undertake, how much this borrowing would cost, and over what period the borrowing would be repaid? Cabinet Secretary. I suppose to understand that, that Murdo Fraser would have to understand the financial headroom that the UK <coughs> Government will have because of economic performance and a range of factors, the UK Government will have more flexibility than they thought they would otherwise have had. So it's no longer necessary to enact the vicious cuts upon public services across the UK and in Scotland and there can be a sustainable borrowing regime that uses a current budget balance to invest in infrastructure in a sustainable way. But I hear Murdo Fraser just say how much. He's just disregarded the information I've just given him, including the very important fiscal lever around financial flexibility from the economic performance that makes the point that the reductions that the UK government propose are unnecessary and ideologically driven, which doesn't surprise me that Murdo Fraser wants to join that club. James Kelly. Thank you, uh, presiding officer. In terms of the Scottish budget, in order to address the su substantial issues uh, which Mr Mackay is responsible for, uh, like giving public sector workers a real terms pay increase, lifting children out of child poverty and ensuring a proper 
settlement for local government funding, does he accept that what is required is a step change in taxation from the government and not simply tinkering around the edges as he did in last year's budget? Cabinet Secretary. No, I welcome uh, James Kelly's uh, point, which is essentially about using the powers of this parliament. And the First Minister and I have said that we will launch a discussion paper that sets out the context of the issue and the principles uh, that we uh, believe in. Uh, that discussion paper's uh, release uh, is now imminent. And I invited uh, all the political parties in the Chamber to contribute to that in terms of tax propositions. And now we know where the Tories are in terms of tax cuts for the richest in society and the cuts in public expenditure uh, that would come along with that. The Liberals uh, and the Greens have given me propositions to consider. Uh, I got an awful nice uh, letter from the Labour Party outlining what they uh, say they believe in, or certainly what Alec Rowley says he believes in, because we only have an interim leader in the Labour Party uh, at the moment. But I, I do look forward to when the Labour Party actually have, have a leader, have a leader in place. Maybe they'll be able to engage in the budget discussions in a mature and responsible yeah. manner that has been absent so far in terms of the budget discussions in Scotland. But our discussion paper, I think, will raise the tone and raise the uh, level of debate in terms of how we fund yeah. our public services. And I look forward uh, to that engagement uh, in the Chamber. Question number two, Neil Findlay. Mr Mackay might tell us what he believes in once the First Minister tells him what he believes in. Um, can I, uh, to ask the Scottish Government how the budget will address the impact of reductions in local government finances to the services in Lothian and across the country? Cabinet Secretary. Well, Mr Finlay, at least I have a leader I can believe in, which is more <laughs> to be said than the Labour Party has had for some considerable time. But in answer to his question, the 2018-9 budget will continue to treat local government fairly despite the cuts to the Scottish budget <coughs> from the UK government. The overall increase in spending power to support local authority services this year amounts to an increase of over £383 million or 3.7% compared to 2016-17. Neil Findlay. When Mr Mackay was a council leader, he believed in cutting the school week to save money. Um, now council leaders are having to uh, look at eye-watering cuts uh, to essential services, the essential services that civilise our communities. So how can we address the appalling health inequalities and other inequalities in our community when jobs will be lost, uh, education, social work, environmental services, libraries and youth work will all be cut, all because of decisions being made by someone who used to be a council leader and who should know better? Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, it's unfortunate Neil Finlay wants to uh, personalise uh, this, but when I was a council leader I was able to invest in schools, invest in new yeah. build, invest in yeah, refurbishment, like target support in the early years, expand uh, free school meals universally uh, across uh, the area and ensure that there was uh, great support and improved uh, attainment as well. So I'm proud of my record as a council leader, but you know, I'm proud of my record as a finance secretary as well that's taken a number of actions, including delivering, deli not just talking about, but delivering the pupil equity fund yeah. to specifically target attainment in yeah. schools across the country and delivered a fair settlement to local government, which I've described as an increase to resources to local government services. And of course, I'll work constructively with COSLA going forward. Indeed, I'll meet them later today when we engage in a mature and responsible discussion around financial matters, something that seems alien to Neil Finlay. Richard Lyle. To ask, thank you, uh, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government, how many local authorities chose not to use their power to increase council tax to fund local services. Cabinet Secretary. It, it, may be, it may be a surprise to some Labour members, but it was actually eight Labour councils who chose <laughs> not to uh, increase the council tax at all, to, to freeze it. You know, one could assume that the local government settlement was so satisfactory that they didn't need to use those powers in an election year. But I would argue they should. Of course, it's a matter for them, but all local authorities should use their local tax raising powers uh, responsibly. But it does remain the case that it was only Labour authorities who chose to freeze the council tax at the same time as telling anyone who would listen that they didn't have the resources to do the job when it was clear that it was a very satisfactory and fair arrangement for local government across the country. Gordon Lindhurst. 
Perhaps the Cabinet Secretary would answer this question. Does he agree that Edinburgh Leisure, which provides affordable leisure facilities on behalf of Edinburgh Council, could be devastated by the twin effects of a cut to its budget of several hundreds of thousands next year, as well as a potentially enormous bill for business rates if the Scottish Government takes on that aspect of the Barclay Review recommendations? Cabinet Secretary. Well, Gordon Lindhurst will be uh, well aware that uh, many people welcomed my actions on Barclay. We went beyond Barclay in terms of a number of the recommendations. Yes, there are some uh, that require further consideration. That is one issue in which further engagement uh, is certainly uh, ongoing in terms uh, of the uh, alios. So I will give that further uh, consideration as we approach uh, the budget and the end of year in terms of implementation plan that I've previously announced. But in terms specifically uh, of Edinburgh, the issue around alios is approximately, and you'll check the record on this and certainly confirm if I'm uh, off on this, but around £50 million, pounds, but I'll double check that. It's less than £50 million pounds in terms of the uh, reliefs given in that particular sector. But just to put that figure into some context, uh, the overall settlement for Edinburgh. So in terms of support uh, for local services and the tax changes that we made uh, available amounted to an increase of nearly 4%. So that was over £30 million pounds of an increase for the city in terms uh, of local serv services. So put that figure uh, into context. But I'll continue to engage on the Barclay recommendations and conclude the matter before the end of the year. Question number three, Jackie Bailey. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to review the operation of the Scottish Futures Trust to help improve transparency. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, there are no current plans to review the operation of the Scottish Futures Trust. SFT, like all Scottish Government non-departmental public bodies, has in place appropriate accountability and corporate governance arrangements to ensure effective stewardship of public funds. Thank you, Bailey. I'm very disappointed to hear that because it's clear that some of the profits made are considerable and I would have thought that we across this chamber sh share a desire to secure best value. But my Westminster colleague Stella Creasy moved amendments to bring transparency to the tax relief arrangements of contractors involved in PPP PFI contracts, yet the SNP failed to support these. Some companies could be making even greater profits due to UK changes to corporation tax. Why is the SNP... Why is the SNP against greater transparency from the UK government, but also against greater transparency in their own backyard? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I, I, th I think this is, is really incredible from Jackie Bailey, who of course supported Labour's uh, PFI over the years, to which our model is far superior in terms of transparency, uh, accountability, value for money, and the contribution that is made to the infrastructure of Scotland. Uh, Audit, Scotland. Audit Scotland will continue to do their work in terms of their work programme and there's been previous reports to parliamentary committees who have said that the uh, level of information has been satisfactory but of course I'm happy to continue uh, to engage uh, with members in, in terms of the operation, ongoing operation of SFT. Ivan McKee. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, how do interest rates compare under the NPT scheme compared to those under PFI? Cabinet Secretary. Well, interest rates are, are lower under NPD compared to PFI, and the total all-in interest rate cost across the NPD and hub is less than 5%. Move to question number four, Finlay Carson. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions the Finance Secretary has had with UK ministers regarding the borderline, Borderlands Growth Deal, which, been, which has been announced by the UK Government. Cabinet Secretary. <coughs> In his statement to Parliament on the 5th of October, the Cabinet Secretary for Economy, Jobs and Fair Work confirmed that we were looking at the borderlands in this inclusive growth deal. Mr Brown has said that we've been entered into detailed discussions with local authorities to explore a deal to support their aspirations. He did call on the UK Government to work with us to support inclusive economic growth for all of Scotland through a coherent and planned programme. Finlay Carson. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer and I'm pleased to hear that the Scottish Government are co collaborating with the UK Government on this deal. On the 8th of April 2016, while visiting Stranraer, George Swinney, John Swinney took the opportunity to announce five key pledges for significant investment in the south of Scotland, including a multi-million pound investment in the Stranraer waterfront redevelopment and improved journey times by road which constituents took as a commitment to upgrades to the crucial A75 and A77. 
With the Borderlands Growth Deal now moving forward, what additional funding will the Scottish Government commit to the people of Dumfries and Galloway to ensure that these pledges are fulfilled? Cabinet Secretary. Hey, I would advise Finlay Carson that the end figure is generally agreed at the end. I, I, I say that to be constructive, that we enter into dialogue with the local authorities, uh, with the UK Government, and I think helpfully sometimes with business and other partners as well to arrive at the best possible a deal, especially with other interests and other contributors to any city deal or, uh, in this case, a, a local arrangement. So we'll engage in this constructively. We make resources uh, available once we've arrived at a deal and I can more accurately answer the question uh, once we know what the contributions may be and the shape uh, of that deal uh, then uh, crystallises. Colin Smith. <laughs> Thank you, President Officer. Having been involved in the Borderlands Initiative uh, from its inception as in my previous role, as Chair of Dumfries and Galloway Council's Economy Committee, I'm pleased that both the Scottish and UK Government are now taking an interest in the Borderlands. The Finance Secretary will by now have received proposals from the five Borderlands Councils for that growth deal. Will they give a commitment that these proposals will be considered for funding as part of the development of his draft budget this December? And will they urge the UK Government to ensure the proposals will be considered by them as part of their November budget so we can see real investment in the Borderlands sooner rather than later? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I thought it was a bit childish from Colin uh, Smythe about uh, who created this uh, initiative. I was, um, I was uh, involved as previously as a, a junior minister, so I know that the SNP has always been involved and interested in this. But again, I say to be constructive that we are engaged in the discussions. We want them to progress. We are we're being positive and constructive around them and hopefully it will lead to appropriate investment and cooperation in the area. And that may well feature, it can feature as early as partners would like, but you have to arrive at the deal to be able to know what uh, economic contribution there may be. And of course, I would consider it in this year's budget if a deal could be concluded in time, uh, but that's for all parties to agree that. But yes, I hope it can be progressed in a satisfactory fashion. Question number five, John Mason. Uh, thank you. To ask the Scottish Government how many businesses in Glasgow receive support from the Small Business Bonus Scheme. Cabinet Secretary. The most recent statistics published just yesterday estimate that almost 10,000 properties in Glasgow are benefiting this year from the Small Business Bonus Scheme. And this is an increase of 2% from last year. John Mason. I yeah, thank the Cabinet Secretary for that reply. I perhaps should declare that my own office uh, benefits from the scheme and does not pay rates, but the saving is not my, myself, but for the Parliament. Uh, would the Cabinet Secretary accept that for many small businesses, this is a huge advantage because they feel they're struggling often to compete with big businesses, and they're very much hoping that the Cabinet Secretary will continue the small business bonus scheme in the future? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, I do envisage it continuing. I should say on behalf of a number of members, I suspect John Mason is right, that a number of members' constituency offices are uh, uh, beneficiaries of this scheme, but uh, over 100,000 properties uh, in, in Scotland are in a similar uh, boat. I think it's been very well received. I think that um, it has been a lifeline for our town centres. There's a range of things we've been able to do on business rates that have made a difference, but I know that SBBS is very valued and a review that will be carried out will ensure that we maximise the economic and social benefits of the scheme. Question number six, Gordon Lindhurst. <clears throat> to ask the Scottish Government what support it provides to encourage growth in the retail sector. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government recognises the value of a successful and vibrant retail sector in response to the recognised challenges to high street retailers caused by the growth in e-commerce, the impact of austerity and inflationary pressures we encourage growth by providing various mechanisms of support for the sector, including a highly competitive non-domestic rates package, with the average rateable value of retail units having reduced at the 2017 revaluation by over 1%. Gordon Lindhurst. Um, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Footfall in Scotland dropped in September by the biggest amount in more than a year, exceeding the UK rate. Does the Minister accept that any rise in the basic rate of income tax would further hurt businesses taking money out of the pockets of Scottish uh, consumers and their ability to spend that in Scotland's shops? Cabinet Secretary. It, well, I would say that the discussion paper that I will launch imminently will put uh, tax issues into context. And of course, there's a relationship between tax and spend as well, how you choose to spend uh, resources that government may also be able to raise. But in terms of business rates, we've taken a number of uh, actions, including 
uh, lowering the poundage, increasing support for small business bonus, uh, changing the thresholds to lift more people out of the large uh, business supplement, and then, of course, the Barclay recommendations, the growth uh, accelerator and no rates, liability and toll occupation. I think all of those interventions are very helpful in terms of uh, supporting uh, the retail sector. In addition to that, there's the Town Centre Action Plan uh, and other interventions which have supported uh, retail. But if we are going to debate tax, we should do it in an informed way, and that's why I think it would be very helpful if all parties contribute in a mature fashion uh, to this debate so that we make the right decisions and decisions that are right for all parts uh, of Scotland, including business. Okay, question seven. Lee MacArthur. I ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update of the progress being made by the Scottish Growth Fund. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, work has been undertaken to develop and design the scheme, working with financial institutions and their enterprise agencies. And there are currently two distinct products under the Scottish Growth Scheme. The £200 million Scottish European Growth uh, Co-Investment Programme, launched on the 16th of June this year, aimed at companies seeking equity investment of £2 million or above, and the new and additional funding to the SME Holding Fund under the scheme to support equity funding up to £2 million. Work is progressing with a number of companies seeking to access investment support under the European programmes. At this stage, six companies have been referred to the European Investment Fund to be considered for investment from the EIF accredited venture capital fund managers, with five engaging in direct discussions with investors. Liam MacArthur. Yeah, can I thank the Finance Secretary for his response? When the scheme was launched more than a year ago, we were told that support would be, quote, largely in the form of guarantees and loans. No loans or guarantees have been paid out. Why should businesses have any confidence in this scheme if 14 months after it was announced, it's still not doing what it said on the tin? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I, I would need to correct uh, Liam McCarth in terms of that. Uh, the announcement in the PFG described what we were launching. It was launched uh, earlier this year. There has been engagement with uh, European opportunities. There's also been specific engagement with banks. And yes, that was partly around the guarantees element to ensure that we get the right products. There's a £500 million commitment over that three-year period. And I am convinced that we will fulfil our commitment that we're doing it in a fashion that best supports uh, economic growth through a range of tools at our disposal. And we'll continue to design it in such a way that in the fullness of time, it gives businesses the support that they say to us that they need.